good to see you this morning. Our lighting's kind of throwing me off. I'm not, usually the lights come off and the lights are already here. So um, we are in this series on the Olympics. And uh, I, was, I wore a gold medal last time. I got, we got this, Sharon got this for me. Um, we looked on eBay and they were expensive. So she ended up going to Ollie's and getting this for like 38 cents. But it, it's, <laughs> it's a gold medal with like something like to pop, you know, a beer thing can at the end, you know. So <laughs> maybe there's an extra message there for, for me on that. Well, <clears throat> so I want you to think about winning gold. That's what we're kind of talking about over the ne- these three weeks. Winning a spiritual goal, a gold medal for God and for our faith. I want you to imagine uh, you're in a race with everybody here in this room. Uh, You begin, you're at uh, the the starting line, you're kind of warmed up, you're ready to run, and uh, everybody takes off, and they're running, and you're feeling good. I mean, you're thinking, hey, why don't I do running more often? And you start running, and the wind is in your hair, and it's in your face, and the sun feels good, and you're going, this is great, I'm running along, and... The birds are flying, the trees are coming by, and and then after a while, though, you start to get tired. Your legs start to hurt, you start to get exhausted, there's burning in your lungs, and you've only gone about 100 yards, but... (laughs) <laughs> and you look around, and some people have already stopped running, they've, they've peeled off, and you're thinking, why should I do this? Is it worth it? And you think, I don't know if I should stay in the race. You know, maybe it's not worth it after all. Maybe I signed up for the wrong reason, and you start getting self-doubt, and you start thinking about it. Listen, the spiritual journey is a race. And we have those same challenges that come on. We start from the finish line. We think, hey, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to do it. And we go and we get into it a little ways. And then obstacles come. It's uphill. There's the wind's not at our back anymore. It's at our front. And we start getting, or there's aches and pains. And we start thinking, why should I do this? And there is a parallel. So that's why we're making that parallel. During the Olympics, we're saying, you know, there's, Something real similar to our spiritual faith when it comes to that. We want to persevere. We want to endure for the long haul. We want to do well. Now, you look in the Bible and you see people that have had the same challenges that you and I have had. For example, in the book of Hebrews, you see the writer of Hebrews. He's talking to Christians that had a great start. In fact, he says, hey, don't forget the good start that you had. You had a good start, but then what happens is they start getting into their walk, into their faith, into life's problems. Things start to become difficult. They start wondering, why should I continue on doing this? And then he addresses it. He talks about it specifically in Hebrews 12. We're going to look at some of those verses there, and we're going to kind of unpack that. But in Hebrews 12, he says, it's worth doing it. He says, therefore, we also Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of, the, of, of, of God. And so he says, Jesus, he kind of is this role model for us in this race of faith that we look to and we say, you know, Jesus did that. And, and in fact, this is what the writer of, of Hebrews is saying. It's he's saying, stay focused, make sure and endure and persevere. Now I want to look at five things that we pull from this verse, from these verses, on how we can apply to our personal race, our spiritual race that we've got going in front of us. And so that we can ra- run the race well, we can finish well. Number one, I find strength from those who have gone before. So we're not the first time, we're not the first ones doing this. Just like when you see these interviews of people that have, have broken records in swimming and, 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 and they say, they say I, I got encouragement from other swimmers. You know, sometimes they watch films, sometimes they were involved with somebody and they tweeted them and, and they said, you know, and they, and they do shout outs on TV. They go, I got encouraged from them. And, and he points uh, here in Hebrews, he points to people that have gone before us. He says, uh, uh, he says that the Bible is, is a book of encouragement for us. It's not just a history book. You know, I just read it like a history. I'm, certainly it has history in it. But there's lessons learned when we read and we learn the, the, the stories of other people that have, have gone through difficulties. 
We find that it's not just moral teachings, not just historical stuff, but it's for my own spiritual growth. Romans 15, 4 says, even if it was written in Scripture long ago, you can be sure it's written for us. So it's words to help us endure, to help us persevere, to help us get through the tough times we're in. He writes off, writer of Hebrews says, therefore we are surrounded by this huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. So he's talking about this, this large crowd of witnesses. Now he's talking about, because he says therefore, and whenever you read therefore in the Bible, you want to find out what it's there for. <laughs> you know, what, what's, what's it going on? And, and he's actually referring to the chapter previous, chapter 11. It's a list of gold medalists in this spiritual, in this spiritual fa- race. He, he, he lists all these people. Some of them are known, some of them not so well known. He says, these are the gold medalists. They're the Hall of Famers. They're the ones that have, have, have set world records in, in, in spirituality. He goes, look at them. They've done it and it wasn't easy for them. Sometimes they were ridiculed. Sometimes they were, they were uh, uh, treated very harshly. Some of them gave up their life. Some of them had to, had, had to, were called to leave their families and their hometowns and their cities where they were comfortable with and go somewhere else. And he says, we can, we can draw encouragement if you're struggling with certain things, you know, with fear. Look at Abraham and how he had to overcome his fears when he was being called into these places that were very, very challenging and dangerous. When you're, if, you're discover, if you're discouraged and you're down and out, go to David and look at David and the places, times when he was in, in discouraged and read the Psalms and read some of the things that he had gone through to get through when he was in a tough place, when he had obstacles that were facing him that were overwhelming. And so the Bible says, we, we, we draw encouragement from that. We draw encouragement from these people. Hebrews eleven thirty eight, 38 and the... Uh, the CEV version says the world did not deserve these good people. In other words, they lived, they're, they're, they lived such stellar lives that even when they were treated disrespectfully or, or belittled for their faith or whatever happened to them, the world wasn't worthy of them anyways. God looks at them and he goes, they are my shining, uh, shining people. They're the, ones that got, they're the ones I put on the pedestal and gave a gold medal to. world didn't recognize that, but, but God says, I did. Because I did. So now I want you to think. It's not just people of the biblical days, but it could be people that have lived before us. It even could be people that live today. The cloud of witnesses is the whole church. The church that's gone before us, the church that's with us today. So I want you to think in your mind, who do I know that when I'm around them, I get more fired up to serve Jesus? They just kind of increase my passion. My cup, you know, if it's here, it goes there. If it's here, it goes there. If it's there, it goes, it overflows. You know, I mean, this, when I'm around them, I become more committed to Christ. I, I sign up. I say, hey, it is worth it. My faith increases. There's people like that. And if you look for them, there's people like that. Most of you could probably think of some one person. Who is it in my life that when I'm around them, I want to serve God even more fervently? I want to do more for them. That person you want to invest more time into. You want to invest peop- in people like that. I want you to write their name down. What person of faith or godliness can strengthen my walk? I gave you a fill in the blank. Write their initials, write their name down, and then pray about that. And say, God, maybe I can spend more time with them. Maybe I can rearrange my schedule. I'm not sure how available. They, they might be somebody in your small group, and it's real easy. Maybe somebody not as available. You say, I just want to... You know, God, open up time. I can spend time with that person or somehow learn from them and be around them more. Number two, I need to put off that which trips me up. If you're in a race, you got to be careful that you don't get tripped up. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. In virtually every athletic event, excess weight is not good. You want to reduce your weight. You want to lighten your load in order to do well. In 2002, in the London Marathon, there was a man who participated in, a, in the marathon, and it became the slowest marathon ever in history. Lloyd Scott finished in five days, eight hours, 
29 minutes and 46 seconds. There's a slide of him. It's because he was dressed like that. You think that'd slow you down? Look at those boots. Full metal helmet. He's clawing through, you know, once. I mean, that's going to slow you down. But he was doing it for a fundraiser. But that is typical of people in, in, in some of their spiritual lives. They're weighted down like that. And then they're wondering why it's so hard. It's so hard to be a Christ follower. Well, yeah, weighed it down like that. And they don't realize that I need to maybe, maybe I need to shed some things off. Sometimes we're always thinking, what am I supposed to do? You know, another important question is what am I supposed to not do? What am I supposed to give up? What am I supposed to let go of? <clears throat> and in this verse we just looked at there, he lists two kinds of things that as a Christ follower, you should look to shed. You want to let go of this. These slowing you down. Number one is to let go of the ungodly. Let go of the things that are sin in your life. You see, when I read the Bible, it reveals things. That's one of the reasons why it can be uncomfortable to reflect, to, uh, to reflect on Scripture and ponder it and meditate on God's Word because the Holy Spirit uses His Word to shine a light on us and our heart and kind of reveal stuff that we don't, we don't necessarily like. We don't, it, 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 hurt, it damages my self-esteem. I already, I'm already on the edge, man. Don't you know, God? I can't take anymore. But God knows that if he, if, if he reveals that stuff, kind of like a surgeon, you know, he says, that's not good for you. And so, you know, let's get that out of there and your true self-esteem will rise. You'll actually be more confident. You'll, be, you'll have more joy. You'll enjoy your, your spiritual walk even more. You'll have better, more fulfilling, more authentic relationships. See, God's saying, I want to help get rid of that stuff. Gets in the way. And so, We've got to be willing to let the Holy Spirit talk to us through that, through His Word. When you come to weekend services, sometimes, sometimes we talk about some stuff and, you know, you're trying to not squirm too much because the Holy Spirit is, you know, and then we immediately think, well, I hope somebody else is listening because I'm feeling uncomfortable and I don't want too much attention on me. Right now, just if, if you were to be honest, right now, for probably everybody here in this room, the Holy Spirit would single and say, you know, there's something I want to deal with in your life. There's something, and it might be different for each one of us, but there's something I want to deal with, something that's weighting you down, that it has no business being in your life. And so the question is, are you willing to let the Holy Spirit take that out of your life? You know, maybe it's some addiction, maybe it's some uh, deceitful business practice you're involved in. Maybe your heart, your heart is not tender towards the uh, the downtrodden towards the needy. Maybe it's uh, something you're, you know, thinking of doing upcoming. Maybe you're, invo- you're, maybe you're playing around with some, some relationship that's flirtatious that you're saying, well, I haven't done anything yet, but the Holy Spirit's not, God's not trying to keep the good life from you. He's just saying that's going to mess you up. That's going to that's gonna weigh you down. Then you also let go of the unnecessary. <clears throat> Sometimes this can be more subtle because it's not, it's not like blatantly a moral compromise, but it's just not good for you. You know, you're just so busy. You don't have time to slow down and think about God and, 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 and get involved in his word or be involved in a small group. Or you're just so involved with your kids with so many extracurricular activities. You don't have time to give them instruction. And point them towards Christ. Maybe you're, you're very caught up in other spiritual activities like watching, you know, the Game of Thrones or House of Cards. And you're just thinking, well, this, this is where I get my spiritual nourishment. <laughs> There's, uh, sometimes it's just distractions like that. We just lots of entertainment. We're very entertainment-driven culture. There's nothing wrong with entertainment, but we're... A lot of people, that's, they fill all their nooks and crannies of their time with entertainment and distraction. A spiritual person who's serious about running a marathon, winning a gold medal for God, they don't let that happen. They, they allow some entertainment, but it's not, that's not their life. That's a portion. And, they, and, and if there's ever a decision, they, they realize, no, I, I'm going to make sure and spend some time with God each day. Notice in 2 Timothy 2.3 says, Endure hardship 
with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. He says, get rid of the unnecessary. If you're a, caught up in civilian affairs and keeping you from doing what God wants you to do, he, your commanding officer, you need to let that go. So fill in this statement. In order to finish well, in order to finish well, I need to let go of what? What do you need to let go of? And fill something in the blank. Now, somebody come up, came up to me last night and said, I put my wife in there. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I understand that sometimes the spouse, you feel like that's the person. If I just let them go, I can really be, I can love Jesus all, all the more. No. Okay, you don't, I'm talking about within God's will, you know. What's something that's keeping you from, from really serving God? Number three. I will have to choose to persevere until I cross the finish line. That's a choice that we make. Now in Hebrews 12, 1, the, uh, the second part of that says, let us run with endurance this race that God has set before us. Now down through the ages, even to our present time, greatness is determined by somebody who's willing to persevere through challenges, through obstacles that come their way. Do you know that there was a memo that came from MGM shortly after Fred Astaire took his first screen test? And in the memo, it said about him, can't act, slightly bald, can dance a little. It's Fred Astaire. And then somebody said of Vince Lombardi that he possesses minimal football knowledge when they were looking for recruiting. Uh, the parents of Enrico Caruso believed their teacher when he said he had no voice at all. He just cannot sing. Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper uh, that he worked for because he lacked ideas, they said. Thomas Edison's teachers gave up on him and gave him an evaluation, quote, he is too stupid to accomplish anything. It's Thomas Edison. Henry Ford, before he succeeded, he went, uh, he went broke five times. He failed. Beethoven handled the violin awkwardly, and his teachers called him hopeless as a composer. Albert Einstein performed so badly in high school, other than mathematics, that his teachers encouraged his parents to pull him out of school. Now, there's plenty of people that are notable and maybe some people that you know that have overcome some big obstacles. If you've watched the Olympics, they do these cutaways, these stories behind the scenes. Look at what this person had to do in order to, over, to overcome to get to the place where they're at the Olympics, much less win. And you just hear these stories and there's, there's things that we have to do to say, you know what, I'm going to have to dig deep in order to overcome the situation I'm in. Now, our culture kind of says, do the easy thing. Do whatever's convenient, whatever's quick, whatever's fast, whatever's in instant. But very little good things happen when we're trying to look for the easy, convenient thing. Eugene Peterson wrote this. He said, quote, there is a great market for religious experience in our world. But there is very little enthusiasm for patient acquisition of character and virtue. Character and virtue, that comes through the long haul. That's not something quick. On the back of your outline, there you see 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Another translation says, be steadfast, be immovable, no matter what the hardship. No, there's no matter how long the storm lasts, no matter how dark the night gets, no matter how scary things get or how bad the waves batter you, you are going to persevere. Now, Paul, this was his motivation. The apostle Paul went through a lot of challenges in his path of following God, his spiritual pathway. In fact, he writes a few of those down. He goes, hey, you know what? As you're thinking about your challenges, he goes, here's a couple of my challenges. Here's what he says. He says, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged severely. Being flogged is being tied to a post. They rip your shirt off. They tie you to a post publicly. Then they beat you. They, they, they whip you and terrible, terrible lacerations. And he's been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received 40 lashes minus one. That means he says five times I received 39 of those public beatings just because he loved Jesus. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been in constant danger. I've labored and toiled. I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I've even been cold and gone without clothing. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressures of my concern for all the churches. Now he goes, hey, I get it. It can be tough. He goes, but I made a decision long ago I was going to follow Christ. So when I went through those temptations, that's not the time. And those trials, that's not the time to think through, oh, well, you know, let me evaluate my commitment to Christ. No, you make the commitment before you begin the race. And th then when you're in those difficult times that inevitably come, when you feel distant from God, you can't seem to hear his voice, or something happens in life and you go, why would that happen? If God's all powerful, if he's all loving, why would he let that happen to me? And we go through those whys and the, all the, the upheavals of that life comes. See, we make that commitment before that. So when we're in those situations, we persevere. That's the key to persevering and endurance is making the commitment way, way before we're in that circumstance that does not make sense to us. I know God wants me to keep on what? I want you to fill something, put something in there. What do you need to keep on doing? Wherever you're at, maybe you're in some challenge in life. I know God wants me to keep on, and that's a blank, fill in the blank, personalized for you to think, this is what I need to do. Where I'm at right now today, God wants me to keep on this. And you just write that in. Keep pressing on. Number four, I'm going to keep a single-minded focus. Single-minded focus. And... Um, that means just keeping our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12 says, We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. So he says focus. Focus is important. How do you focus on Jesus? Well, focus is an act of concentration. What I'm going to look at, I get to choose what my eyes focus on. And then focusing on the right thing. Now listen. It does not say you're supposed to focus your eyes on your small group or on your small group leader or your host. It doesn't say you're supposed to focus your eyes on your pastor or on the pastoral staff or on Vineyard Community Church. You're supposed to focus your eyes on Jesus. Amen. That's what we're about. Listen, Vineyard Community Church has failed you if we do not teach you to focus your eyes on Jesus. That's what we want. That's what we're about here. It's about we're after following Jesus. Not about people. Because people will fail you at some point. They'll disappoint you. They'll drop the ball. They'll hurt you. All those things. That's just true because we're part of fallen humanity. So we focus our eyes on Jesus. He's the one who's going to get you through this. He's the gonna, if you're going to get a goal, it's going to be because you had the wherewithal the ability to concentrate and focus your eyes on Jesus day in, day out. When things get tough at work, when you get the medical diagnosis that's not what you wanted, when you don't get the job or when you are tempted at work to do something wrong and all those things, all focus your eyes on Jesus. Focus your eyes on Jesus. That's how we get through that stuff. Now, you go, well, how do I do that? You know, I mean, focus your eyes on Jesus. You know, how do I focus on God? It's, maybe it's easier said than done, right? You know, just, and I don't want it to just be a, a trite cliche for you. I just focus your eyes on Jesus. You know, well, okay. Well, let me just say this. Part of focusing your eyes on Jesus is posturing your life in such a way where you can do that. And for many of us, we run at a very fast pace. And when we run at a fast pace, the truth is Christianity is more of a walk than a run. So I'm using running as a metaphor, but it's really more of a walk. And it's in walking where we slow down enough to fill our soul, to be able to connect with God. It's, it's when we're in the left hand of the Autobahn with our hair on fire, going full blast. Very good, very little stuff happens to our soul. 
Your soul is fed. Your soul is nourished when we slow down. God speaks to us in the margins of life. When we allow places where God, you know, of silence, places where God can speak, where it's not all filled up with everything. Many of us are very, very busy. And so we get up and we say, God, you're going to have to keep up with me because I am busy today. And I need you though. So, but keep up, I, you know. <laughs> it's when we, and, and granted, I mean, life can be very busy. And the many times I structure my day like that, where I give myself more things than I can do because I want to be efficient. I want to I sort out the things that are good from the things that are best. And one of the ways I do that is, is I have a, a bigger list than I can accomplish and I have to choose. And that's good for time efficiency and energy efficiency, but it can be a problem if you're going to nourish your soul. And so I have the same, the same concern with my own life. See, a hurried life doesn't cause us sometimes a hurried spirit and doesn't cause somebody to grow in the Lord and focus on Jesus. And so then we multitask on top of that. But if we weren't busy enough, we're going to double it up. You know, and so I'm not just going to go to the bathroom. I'm taking my phone so I can check my, my, my emails while I'm going and uh, while I'm in the commode, you know. And we just, just keep layering it on and on. So somehow we've got to pull back a little bit and say, you know what? I need to make sure I have time for the things that are going to nourish my soul. Now, small groups would be, would be one of those things. When we talk to, we've done many surveys and we've interacted with a number of people over the years in our church and we find that most people would much, that when we talk to two issues, uh, like for example, giving and attending a small group. Many people say, I don't have any problem giving money, but don't ask me to go to a small group. And you'd think it'd be the opposite. You know, don't touch my money. No, actually people go, no, I'll give you my money, but my small, I don't want to go to a small group. But that's, many times their reason is they're just too busy. See, they're, they're moving along. They got so much going on. But I bet if you were to really sit down and map out, what is it going to take me to go end with a gold medal in my spiritual life? I wonder how many of those things go that direction. You know, you have to strategically, if any of you have done strategic planning, you know that. The things that are important must go in first. If you were to lay out your year and maybe a 10-year thing and say, I want to be here spiritually, how am I going to get there? You're not going to get there by accident. It's going to have to be intentional actions that you do. And you're going to think, oh, probably going to church would be good, right? Going to church. And church is good. Coming on a weekend service is helpful. But you need more than that. You know, if you were to think of coming to church like, some people think of it like, you know, I could drive my car and I need gas, right? About once a week. And that's kind of like my life. You know, I drive around spiritually and then on Sundays is where I fill her up, Andy. You know, I need some gas. But if, for that metaphor, church would be more like an oil change rather than gas. You need gas every day. See, every day you burn about a thousand miles in your spiritual tread. And so you can't wait 7,000 miles until you get your next oil change. You need your oil change around three or 4,000 miles. That's why we have small groups. And you, you, okay, I need another oil change. And then to the weekend service, I need another oil change. Each day you're filling up. You're going to God and you're going to his word and you're reading it. And here's, my challenge for you, if you're not reading God's word, and you know if you are not, and of course your spouse knows too, but don't worry about that. If you're not reading God's word every day, you're just not reading, maybe days and days go, maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe you just don't do it. Here's my challenge for you, five minutes a day. Can you do five minutes? You can't do five minutes. Five minutes a day, and here's the, here's the key. I've got a, a plan for you today. Okay, here's my plan for you. Studies show overwhelming amount of people. Most people, the first thing they do is they pull out their smartphone and they check their social media. They go onto Instagram, they check Facebook, or they check their emails. Here's my challenge to you. 
Before you do that, you read God's word for five minutes. Before you do now that, and that's just not that it's a hard and fast rule. It's just your kind of your, your way of making sure that gets in. Because certainly if you can read your social media for five minutes, you can spend time reading God's word for five minutes. So just, just five minutes before you open an app. You're going, you're getting, you're getting personal now, man. I don't know if I like this. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to do well, you need to do what it takes. And so you just, before you open an app, you check, you just read the Bible for five minutes and just say, God, speak to me through that. And you spend a little time with God and you, you pray and you, and, and maybe memorize a verse, you know, memorizing God's word is very helpful. And so you maybe put a verse on the refrigerator and you just say, okay, another, uh, here's another thing you can do. You can say, before I eat anything, I, out of that refrigerator, I have to be able to say that verse without looking at it. Some of you will get very thin. It'll be a great, great way to lose weight. <laughs> what a diet plan, right? <laughs> And you just say, I'm going to do this. And you get serious about it. It's going to take that kind of, runners go through a lot of preparation. They think through their strategy. They think, how am I going to do well if I'm going to get, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do well, if I'm going to get a gold, if I'm going to succeed. Philippians 3 says, what is more? I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. He says there is nothing more important than this. Nothing more important than your relationship with Christ and doing well. Don't get caught up in what the world does. You know, there's a lot of things that, that the world does. You don't want that as your role model. You want to you stay focused. When I was a, a, a high schooler, I had, some, I had a dirt bike and I used to race dirt bikes with my friends. And, and one of the things with dirt bikes is you can, you can go anywhere with those things. I mean, they get all muddy and crusted with mud and dirt everywhere. And they're all, they're just, you know, just caked with mud and dirt. But when it comes time to fuel it, you carefully take the fuel cap off. You give it pure fuel, maybe even if you need to, you sift it through a cloth to make sure it's pure because anything in there can cause the engine to not perform well. And life is like that. We get out in the world and we get muddy, we get filthy. There's nothing wrong with that. But if any sin is bouncing around inside of us, that can cause us to not perform well. And so we need to make sure and just surrender that to God. Say, God, you know, I'm going to let you get that stuff out of me because I want to perform well. I'm in the world, but I'm not going to be caught up in all what the world does. Number five, this lastly and, uh, and quickly, I will endure my present difficulties to see God smile. Hebrews 12 says, he who's talking about Jesus, he was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterwards. Jesus is the sterling example of somebody who kept the per eternal perspective. You see, when you're in that tough place in your life, when you're, when you're, when you're just feeling low and you, you don't feel like you have people there to support you and you feel like you're, you've been just, you're way behind. There's nothing more discouraging than being in a race and you're towards the end. And you're wondering, I don't even know if it's worth it. I mean, I'm not getting a goal at this point. And maybe you just, you just feel like, is this worth it? And it, it's keeping the eternal perspective. You know, in other words, when you're running, you don't just look down all the time. You look up. Say, hey, that's the goal line. That's the goal line. And, and when we're going for the goal line, it changes everything. You start to realize, wait a minute. There's a reward for everybody who crosses that finish line. Everybody. Unlike the Olympics, where just three medals are given out. In God's kingdom, he gives medals to everybody who crosses the finish line. So you keep looking up. So you go, why go through all of this? Why go through this pain? My, everything hurts. You look up. Ah, there's, that's the reason. Eternal perspective. Look at this, these verses and then we'll close. Paul writes, these little troubles. What little troubles? The ones he was talking about where he was 
tied to a post and beaten for Christ and stoned and shipwrecked. He goes, these little troubles are getting us ready for an eternal glory that will make all our troubles seem like nothing. Seem like nothing. How can you make that comparison? By having the eternal perspective. You look up, you go, yeah, yeah, that's what it's about. Everything around me says, no, no, just think of this. Are you happy today? That is the wrong question. The right question is, is am I going for the reward? Am I, remember what that's about. And then the writer talks about the finish line. He says, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us to heaven. And so I want you to write in, I am able to endure my present circumstances because of what? And you write something in. What is it for you? Maybe you say, well, the pain will be gone. Or the relationship will be restored. So that I can hear God say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. So that I can get those rewards. I mean, whatever, you have to kind of think through. Maybe, maybe you need to put more than one. But you write on, why? That is an important question. Why continue on when it's so difficult? Every great athlete has to think through that. Every, every athlete, they're already asking them, well, which ones, are gonna, which ones will we see at the next Olympics? And which ones are going to retire? They're thinking through. Will I pay the price? There's always that question. Will I, and, and if so, why? It's worth knowing that. If you, if you have to leave that blank, I challenge you, go home and pray about it. Say, God, I need to know. I need to know why am I going to persevere and endure when it's so difficult. And I'll tell you right now that it's going to have something to do with an eternal perspective. Something beyond the finish line. What's, what, are you, what are you in it for? What motivates you to keep, keep striving, keep moving forward? Well, we're going to close in prayer. I want to invite the prayer teams to come up. We have our prayer teams. They would love to pray for you. And we've seen God move time and time again. I'm going to ask you to all to stand as I close in prayer. Some of you are in a very tender place right now. And um, I'm going to pray for you. Some of you need to come forward and just say, you know what, I need more prayer. I need additional prayer. I need somebody to stand with me in my, in my present circumstance. We'd love to do that. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray for every Every, every soul here, Lord. The world would want to condition us and convince us to go one way. And your word, your Holy Spirit is so counterculture. <clears throat> and so God, I, I know that that ultimately we need to hear from you. That your presence changes the human heart. And so God, we invite you right now. Come into this place. If you're out on the fringes, maybe you're out there feeling pretty distant right now. Before I pray for everyone, I don't want you to have to be there. I'm going to invite you in. Jesus calls you in. You go, well, how do I do that? Well, it begins by just recognizing God's holiness. You're, you're, the fact that you are far away and just say, God, today I want to move towards you. Would you do that just in your own mind? Say, God, today I want to come towards you. I want to surrender my life. I want to be the person that moves forward on, on this spiritual pilgrimage that will end well for me. And you declare your faith to Christ. Say, Jesus Christ, I put my faith in you. And then everybody just, would you pray, God, help me to stay close to you. When the feelings fade, the emotions go, 
when I don't feel like you're near me or you can hear me. Help me to stand firm in those places. Some of you, you have something that's weighing you down. And you're not going to make it if you don't cut it loose. You're just going to have to cut it loose. And that takes a lot of courage. And when the Holy Spirit shines and puts his spotlight on that thing, he'll give you the power to, 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 to step away from it. I know from my own personal life, time and time again, I invite you to do that. Just say, God, give me the courage. Give me the desire to step away. The thing that's holding me back, weighing me down. And Lord, from this day forward, help us to stay focused on our eternal perspective to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.